Do you feel frustrated trying to grow your franchise? Are you having trouble balancing your consumer and franchise development marketing? Do you wish there was an easier way? Imagine if you had a proven roadmap to take your franchise's marketing from costing you to making you money. That's why we've created the Franchise Growth Blueprint. We walk you through the exact same process that we use to run franchise marketing campaigns for our clients at scale that has resulted in triple digit growth. This blueprint isn't for anyone. It's not for people just starting a franchise. It's not for franchises without long-term goals. This is for franchises that want to scale up their marketing in a predictable and profitable way using a proven roadmap. If you want to sell more franchises, keep your current franchisees happy, and learn from people who have already done it, go to FranchiseGrowthBlueprint.com and sign up today. That's FranchiseGrowthBlueprint.com. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of the Franchise Marketing Podcast. Today, I'm very excited. I have Angela Cote on. Uh, for those of you who don't know her, she is an absolute rock star in the franchise space. Super insightful, super helpful. Angela, welcome. Well, thank you. That was quite the intro. I appreciate it. And I, I just, I would just get interviewed on podcasts all day long if I could. Can this be like a full-time job somehow? Totally, totally. <laughs> love it. I love having the opportunity to chat, chat with people and, and share insights. And usually I learn something too, just from having to answer the questions. So it's great to be here. Thank you, Jordan. No problem. So for the audience that doesn't know you, could you give a brief introduction to yourself and what you do? Yeah, sure. So um, my my world of franchising goes all the way back to 1980. Don't worry, I'll keep this as short as I can. But um, I grew up with the brand M&M uh, Meat Shops, which is now rebranded to M&M Food Market in Canada. Um, we grew to almost 500 locations over the years. So whether I liked it or not, I was learning about franchising and, and taking it all in. I dressed up as Kelly Kebab at grand openings. You've maybe heard of that. <laughs> um, and uh, learned probably the most about, about franchising when I was um, in my early 20s. I was running around in the field helping franchise or franchisees, um, you know, showing up female uh, young boss's daughter trying to get these older male franchisees to listen to me. And you can only imagine how well that went over. So uh, it's actually an area of passion of mine is, you know, fran franchisee relations and that. And I think it really stems from that time of a few years where I was in that in that role um, and uh, spent 18 years also as a multi-unit franchisee. So um, having lived and breathed in the, in the, on the franchisee side has really helped me also get, you know, more perspective on, on what's needed for, for franchise franchisees and franchisors to really optimize, you know, profitability. And so um, did you want me to go into what I do now or are we just doing background? <laughs> no, please, please, uh, you know, uh, share what okay. you do now. Yeah, so I'll segue that into, uh, so what I do now as of uh, the past about five years is, uh, and it happened sort of organically that I was um, trying to kind of figure out something new to do in my life and was seriously thinking about like maybe nothing to do with franchising, nothing to do with retail, you know, I need a different different thing. And, and in my networking, I stumbled across people who were like, wait a minute, you come from the m and meat shops. And for any of your American listeners that, you know, don't know, M&M became a, an iconic Canadian brand. So people in Canada would be like, wait, did you just say m and I'm like, yeah. And they're like, oh, I'm, I'm trying to franchise my business. Would you go for coffee? Um, you know, all these things. So I, I started doing that and realizing, oh, there's, there's like need for this. And I'd love to be able to help people. So it started out that I was really helping people in the early stages of, um, you know, should I franchise or I've started and I'm not you know, sure what to do. My franchisees aren't listening to me, you know, all these things. But, um, you know, as I said, my true passion is in the franchise relations. And that is, I mean, the, the, the end of the day, that's what franchise successful franchising comes down to. So I, I really wanted to focus on that, on that area, whether it was an emerging franchise or, or, or fully established, but needed revival, you know, with their franchisees. So that's, that's really my passion area, but I do have, I built up a team and we do help people work or go through the early stages if they're trying to figure out if and how um, we help people with understanding better, uh, you know, how to find their first few franchisees, 
Um, and then also, you know, getting in there and in various ways, whether it's talking directly with their franchisees and finding out why they're not compliant to the system, what, what's going on, how do you feel about this, what's, you know, what needs to change and, and getting in there and trying to, trying to fix things. So that's using that background from Kelly Kebab to uh, Franchise Growth Catalyst. That's, that's what I do. Wow. Wow. A, a ton of, you have a ton of insights. So, you know, working with franchises on a day-to-day -day basis, what are, you know, let's say three of the biggest mistakes that you see them making just consistently? Yeah, well, let's, okay. So we'll keep it to like emerging sort of more early stage, I think here, right? Um, yeah. Because we could also do the, we could do a follow up when we talk about the mistakes that the established ones make, if you want, as well. Um, because it's easy when you're on the outside, right, to see these things, and that's the thing about, um, you know, getting outside help. And and you know, I listened to a few of your podcasts, which were great, and especially loved Kurt Belding and how he said one of the biggest things he would have done different is he would have got help early on instead of the Wild West, you know. And so, um, you know, yeah. So that segues into. Actually, one of the things that I see early on is that franchisors, they get, they, you know, they realize, oh my gosh, they didn't realize they were actually starting a whole new business when they franchise. And they were really good at, you know, running a salon or running a fitness business or whatever their business is. And they don't actually have maybe the leadership skills or the skills to be a franchisor. And because this is all so new, they really start to doubt themselves and they start to listen to people that they otherwise wouldn't necessarily have listened to. And so, you know, they, then they start to spend their money in the wrong places and things. And um, one of the things that I see that just breaks my heart the most is they get put into what I call the franchise factory. Mm -hmm. So ha have you heard of this term? What do you know about the franchise factories? Yeah, I, I have heard the term uh, thrown around and it's essentially, you know, you, you hire this company or this consultant or whatever, and they just throw a bunch of templated stuff at you. You know, you sign some documents, you fill out some templates, bada bing, bada boom, you're done and you're out. Yeah. And, and I see this, I can't tell you how often I see this. And what happens is the person thought that they needed these tangible things. They need you. You totally do need an FDD. That's no doubt. You do need an operations manual, but do you need a $25,000 operations manual from the beginning? Um, and a, a templated one that isn't even, it's got, you know, like I, I had people come to me and they're like, like I'm a coding business and there's restaurant, there's analogies to a restaurant in my, F, in my operations manual. Cause they clearly use a template, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so they, they, the franchisor feels like, Oh, this is what I need. I need these tangible documents. But they, what they don't realize is what they need most is to really be thinking about like, they need to step back. Like this is the takeaway I would give people for this topic of, you know, doubt that they have the, is to step back and, and check your gut on what the, like you're a good business person. You've, you've figured out a business model and you start to doubt yourself, step back and go, do I trust this vet, 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 vet the person, like vet the company that you're going to work with, whether it's me or someone else, really look at their background, talk to their other clients and, and get a sense. So um, I'm really trying to help keep people out of the franchise factories because I don't believe that that, you know, I, I believe that people are spending more money than they need to at the wrong time. You know, like let's get an operations manual, but let's just kind of get, the, the kind of the bare minimum of what we need to make sure that the franchisee is following the system, mm -hmm. but let's know that we're going to develop that. Let's, let's invest that money into making it pretty and fancy. Once we know a little bit more about this after we've gotten a few franchisees on, on, on board. So that would be, does it, any questions on that? Does that make sense? Yeah. You know what? That, that totally makes sense. And you know, it, it mirrors what I see as well, because you know, when you're first starting off as a franchisor, inevitably you go through several, several pivots, several iterations and investing too heavily in one thing, you know, you end up shooting yourself in the foot by, you know, spending thousands and thousands of dollars in something that will change eventually. Mm -hmm. And even, and not to, you know, I love digital marketing, <laughs> but you know, I don't, what, what, one of the things I see people do out of order is 
they might not even have a clear website or they're not clear on what's, what sets them apart and they go drop ten like $10,000 a month trying to get leads. Mm-hmm. Well, then they end up not knowing how to deal with these leads and wasting money there. So I think, you know, I think so that, yeah, the number one uh, key point I was making there is, is uh, trust your gut a little more and, and slow things down on that just to think about it a little bit more. And that's where getting, yeah, getting help. Like, Kurt Belding had said there on that podcast, like find someone that you trust and, and get that help. So that's, that's one of not the top one, but it's one of the big mistakes. Totally. Totally. I like it. So, so what's that second mistake that you Okay. Say? So another one um, that I got asked this actually, uh, I'm not sure if you were at the springboard uh, virtual conference the other day. I, I was not. I didn't get well, it. let's shout out to these guys because any of your, your uh, listeners should know about spring, the springboard emerging franchise or conference, and it'll be next year in September, hopefully in person in Philadelphia, highly recommend it. Uh, it was virtual this year. They did their best to make it fun and whatever considering. Um, but I was asked in one of the mentor pods, like, what do you think is the biggest mistake or what would be the one thing that you would tell, you know, uh, a franchisor to do right. And that is getting the right franchisee. And I know everyone says this and people are like, well, that's obvious, you know, but how, and so what I tell people on this, this is the takeaway on it is, that there are some key traits of a high performing franchisee, regardless of the brand. And actually um, I'm happy to make that. It's a resource that people can easily get on my website or we can make it uh, available directly through you. And I call it the DNA of a high performing franchisee. So there's 10 traits and I won't go through them because people can check that out, but it's the, it's things like, um, having a little bit of leadership skills, you know, being able to lead a team, most franchise businesses are small business and now you've got entry level staff. And if you've never done that before, (laughs) it's a different ball game. So there's the the DNA that I believe is foundational. And then there's the DNA that relates to your brand. So different brands, fitness brand is going to probably find somebody who has some uh, love for fitness and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So I think that, yeah, the, the, the finding the right people, it's, uh, it, it's just so expensive, not just financially, but on your, your mental energy and your draining of resources when you don't have the right franchisee. When you get the right franchisee, everything is so much easier. And your franchisees become ambassadors of the brand and, and like the number one driver of franchise company growth overall is happy, profitable franchisees. And the only way they're gonna be that way is if they're the right fit. Mm -hmm. So I can't emphasize enough. So that, so get clear. And if you're going, I don't know how to know that start with looking at the DNA thing that I'm talking about here, the resource, maybe, is it possible to make that somehow available? Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll add that in the show notes for sure. Yeah. And they can certainly just, people can even just email me at Angela at Angela We'll do that at the end, but, um, get clear on that. And then think about what traits seem to be important. And, and also you can study the founder, like the founder, study yourself. If you're the founder and you don't have a franchisee yet, what drove you to start this and like, kind of look at those traits. So getting the right franchisee. So that's number two. Um, and then a third one, and, and there's so many different things we could talk about here, but I, I'm picking these ones for today. It's it sort of changes depending on the problems I'm seeing at the time. Um, but the third one I would say, and it kind of relates to the first point about, not, about doubting yourself is I think franchisors and I feel, I feel not just think, I feel strongly that franchisors that are very early on should do their own franchise recruitment, taking mm-hmm. franchisees through the recruitment process back to the doubt thing. What happens is they think, I don't know how to do franchise sales. And they go to these conferences and they or now virtual and they are, they're hearing all these things. Oh, you know, it's a big thing to do. And it is, it is, but you know, oh, you need to get the right person in that, you know, franchise sales role and all that. Well, I believe it's super valuable for the very early stage franchisor to know how to do it, mm-hmm. um, to take people through the process and, and, get someone help hire someone to help teach you how to do that. There's lots of people out there, like something I do, of course, but there's other people out there to coach you on how to do it and how to look for red flags. When do you show the FDD? When do you, uh, how do you run a discovery day? How do you run a virtual discovery day? How do you optimize that these days, but get someone to coach you on that so that you, cause you will learn so much about your candidates and about what you're looking for by sitting down over and over and having these conversations. Mm-hmm. And 
I find, and, um, you know, I think you mentioned you've had Ruth, one of my amazing clients, Ruth, like Badgie on that, one of your podcasts. I don't know if it, by the time this goes out, if that'll be out, but, uh, from code Wiz, she's a perfect example. She's an introvert and she's like, I don't like franchise sales. And I'm like, I'm going to help you. And so we've been working and, you know, I get on calls with her if she wants, but she's totally confident now to do the process. Um, to ask the right questions and, and to keep people, you know, engaged and, and it, cause it's not sales. It's, it's, it's vetting. It's, it's checking if we're aligned. If, if I'd rather tell the person, you know, you mentioned you really don't like dealing with entry level staff. You're going to hate this and you are not, it's going to be really hard for you to be profitable. Wouldn't you rather me tell you that <laughs> at the beginning? So yeah. So I really, I think it's super valuable for a f- emerging franchisor. They, they so often farm it out and then they get misfit franchisees. Mm-hmm. So whether, I mean, if you do want to farm it out, be very involved, you know, if you don't want to be responsible, but even then, I just think it's really good to start to understand at what point, you know, when do you disclose the FDD? What, how do you handle the disclosure that, you know, when the questions, how do you handle those tough questions? You're going to learn so much. Like a lot of franchisors get to 10 units and they outsource it and they don't even really know their FDD. And now they don't know how to guide their franchisees that they have in the system, you know, to stay compliant to that. And they're like, so, yeah. So, so that was, that was a lot of information I just threw at you, but uh, just to summarize the three things are like, be careful about doubting yourself. Um, And then really getting clear on, on who you're looking for and only bringing in the right franchisee as far as you can tell at least and then three is is doing your own uh, franchise recruitment if possible like get help with that but do it yourself I, I i love those three tips angela and i feel like that third one of of uh of really developing and running your fd sales process helps lend a hand in your second point of becoming more and more let's call it picky and strict with finding who's a good franchisee and who's not a good franchisee so i love it now, a question that I have for you is, as you've seen uh, franchises grow and scale, have you seen the types of franchisees being brought into the system change uh, as it matures? We'll get right back to the show, but do you feel frustrated trying to grow your franchise? Are you having trouble balancing your consumer and franchise development marketing? Do you wish there was an easier way? Imagine if you had a roadmap to take your franchise's marketing from costing you to making you money. That's why we've created the Franchise Growth Blueprint. To find out more, visit FranchiseGrowthBlueprint.com. That's FranchiseGrowthBlueprint.com. Now back to today's episode. That's such a good question. And, and I'm so excited to talk about this because it's, uh, it, yeah, very much so. So, you know, um, we, we're looking for early adopters. And actually, here's a little bonus uh, mistake that is, I see a lot that like a bonus tip, Mm -hmm. Um, because people are early stage franchisors are so worried about these prospects thinking that they've got everything put together, they oversell how proven the system is. And then what you end up doing is you bring someone in that isn't as, as comfortable with things not, or isn't as isn't expecting it to be not as, you know, tied up with a bow. And so they get upset because they're expecting you to have a lot more figured out. So in the early stages, here's the little tip and then I'll answer the question, but I encourage people to, t- to be open and flip that on its head and say to the prospects, Hey, we're looking for early adopter types that understand that right now we don't have everything figured out and you get to be a part of that. And if that gets you excited, then you might be a fit. But if you're coming in here and expecting systems to be like, you know, like a Wendy's or an A&W or McDonald's, we are so not there yet. And if you, but if you want to help us shape the, like at the end of the day, we're going to make the final decision, but we're going to be very interested in what you, you know, what's important and, and how we support you. You're going to, you're going to be one of our guinea pigs, like the first few people. Um, however, so here's the, the answer to that question is yes, we do want franchisees that are more entrepreneurial within the system, you know, again, there's ways that you can vet that out by asking questions about like other times that they've had to follow systems. Tell me an example of that. When did you thrive? Whatever. Again, all in the interest of making sure that uh, you're going to be able to be successful in this. Mm -hmm. But 
as you grow, you need people that are less and less entrepreneurial because the systems do get buttoned down. And so there's actually, um, actually a shout out to, uh, Zorical Profiles, Rebecca Monet is actually, she would be awesome for you to have on this podcast. <laughs> I'll tell you more about her after. Um, but she's got a tool that is phenomenal for profiling candidates. And it actually has, it's like a psychomet, uh, psychometric analysis. I might have that wrong. She'll tease me later. But um, it, when the, the candidate takes this profile, it actually shows on the scale of entrepreneurial to like somebody that would fit, fit best in an established system it shows where they fit. Hmm. So, if you, so if you were uh, interviewing a candidate and it showed up that they would fit best in an enterprise sort of stage, you would know right away, you're going to be very uncomfortable at this early stage. Mm -hmm. That's um, so, cool. And I'm sure yeah. it's a ton of time. So is, is there like a, a certain threshold that um, franchisors should be switching this, this, um, you know, this, growth yeah, entrepreneur minded person to that enterprise, you know, by the book, dotted I's cross T's. Is, is there like a hard and fast rule for that? I, I don't think there is exactly, but I think I, I would say probably the first um, five are the first five. And then you're going to start to get a little bit more systems. I would say by about 30, you got to be start to be really careful on the systems. This is pretty subjective what I'm saying here. Um, but the other thing I wanted to mention that uh, I really encourage people to, to be aware of and do is when you bring in an, uh, one of these early adopter entrepreneurial people, and actually I encourage this for anybody to do in any stage of your franchise or any stage you are as a franchisor with your franchise recruitment is have a conversation, believe it or not, in the recruitment process about when this person's going to exit. Mm -hmm because we don't want to make that be like a problem. And where I'm going with this is the early stage, early adopters often start to get uncomfortable when the systems start to get more strict because they were used to being able to test things and, and have that leeway. And so you might get to like, they might get five years in and you might start to see that they're, they're not quite right. And that's when you have a conversation and you say, Hey, remember when you first came on and we said like, it's going to get more systemized and you're going to probably get uncomfortable. Well, now's that time we can help you sell mm -hmm. so that you can go find something that makes you happy. Or we can maybe talk about bringing you on the corporate team. Maybe you have, there's a role for you to be innovative on the corporate team, or maybe we start an innovation committee and you head that up. But like being aware that that's going to happen and being preventative about it is super valuable because you're not all of a sudden going, why are they not following the system? You know, you're kind of anticipating it, watching for it and keeping it light. I love that. It, it's, it's all about being proactive rather than, than, than reactive. Right. And I love that, that committee type, the innovation committee that, uh, that you mentioned, that's, that's a fantastic idea. So a Angela, one question I always love to ask is what advice would you give someone just starting out as a franchisor? Yeah, well, it's going to sort of sound redundant a little bit here, but I would say, I think I would say the biggest thing, and I guess I might sound biased, but I've just seen it happen over and over again. So I would just really encourage people to find whether they, you know, whether it's a coach or, or a mentor that commits to you can't be just a hotline. No, mm -hmm. the hotline mentor is great, but they're not tuned into your business and, and helping you course correct. And, you know, so I would say getting somebody that understands the early stages of franchising and those problems uh, on your team. And it's, it's a tough thing because it's intangible and, and they don't always think that they're going to see the ROI, but you talk to any franchisor, you've had Steve Collette. I was just talking to him by the way, earlier today and about how he had all those challenges early on and how things are so good now, but you know, how much he had to go through to get there. And he's like, I wish I would have had somebody helping me early on, you know? So I'd say, get someone to help you, um, and be hold you accountable to doing the things that you need to do to move the business forward ongoing. And again, if it's a mentor, that's awesome, but just make sure there's accountability and, and like um, continuity with it. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I love that. And I love that. And, and even if it's like a, 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 like a support group of peers, right. Just kind actually, of chatting with you and all that. Go ahead. I was just going to I was just going to actually, that was perfect segue. Cause I was just going to say, you know, for, with franchisees, we, we give them these opportunities or we, 
should be giving them opportunities to collaborate mm -hmm. and learn from each other because they're all running the same business. And if you're not doing that as a franchisor, you really should be because there's so much um, that you can leverage from that. And so um, I, I think franchisors need to collaborate with each other more because it is so, it's so unique and they're running, you know, they're running their own um, business. And I talk to them and they're like, it's so good to have somebody that understands this because my other business friends that are CEOs of traditional corporations or, or whatever are not dealing with this stuff that I'm dealing with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. Totally. I love it. I love it. And, and you run the, uh, the play bigger groups as well, which is which yeah. from my understanding, it's kind of similar, right? Yeah, absolutely. So this, for this exact reason, and actually another, we have all the same contacts. I was going to say another person that, you know, of course, is Robert Bruski. Shout out to him, control V. Um, it was actually, uh, he actually kind of pushed me to do this because, um, he was at, we were both at this springboard conference actually last September. And he's like, this is great. There's like all this brain power in, in the room. Um, and I'm learning from these panels and there's a little bit of networking at these cocktails, but I want to build relationships with these other franchisors. And we all go back to our own businesses and we might quick call each other for help with this or that, but I kind of wish I could have a way to build relationships with these people. So he actually helps me create these play bigger groups where we bring together a small cohort of hand selected franchisee, or French, sorry, franchisors um, to meet uh, bi weekly to uh, talk about the challenges. They have to come with a challenge every time, and the group supports each other. And it has been so I've got one the pilot group that Robert and Ruth are actually both in, and a couple other people. And in that pilot group, it has been it's just so incredible to see that what has really moved the needle has been the building of trust. Anybody can run a mastermind where you just open up your books and start like picking away at, yo, you should do this. You should do that. But to, to build that trust, to get people to go beyond to get vulnerable with each other mm -hmm. has been incredible. So that's what I'm doing with my play bigger groups. Um, they're, we're, they're just in the works right now. I mentioned Rebecca Monet. We're actually using Zoracle profiles to, to vet who we put together in groups, huh. which is pretty neat. Yeah. So, um, we're really concerned with optimizing the fit because we believe if we have the right fit, that's when the magic will happen. Totally. Totally. So Angela, you've been sharing some great insights so far. So, th so thank you for that. Um, one way I like to end all my podcasts is with something I call the lightning round. So just some fast paced, quick questions for you. Um, All right. I'll do as quick as I can. <laughs> no pressure. Let me talk. Yeah. Uh, so first question is, what is your favorite tool or app that you cannot live without? Right now, I'm, uh, besides I love, love LinkedIn, but I'm going to say Voxer. Um, for anybody that doesn't know, it's a voice messaging app and I use it with my clients and my team. It's an app on my phone and it's a voice message. So I can, with the clients, I can hear their voice. So they, so like Ruth could reach out to me and say, Hey, Angela, um, you know, I just had this, uh, this thing happen. What should I do? Um, and I can listen to it when I'm ready, but mm -hmm. usually within the day mm -hmm. and I can respond with my voice. I'm not sitting there typing. I'm not a millennial. I don't, <laughs> I'm not great at sitting and typing on my phone. Um, so we use it back and forth. My team, we have group chats where we all keep in the loop and it just saves us so much time. So that's, that's cool. the, the app. Yeah. Voxer. So, okay, great. So second question is what is your favorite book uh, for business? I'm going to say, and I know you, it could be either, but I'm going to say, uh, traction for, for franchisors to get set up on traction. I, I use it. It's probably, yeah, it's all, it's sitting right here. I've got it. It's, it's, the book that I recommend the most right now, there's so many good books. Um, I also am a huge, right now I'm, I'm doing a lot of listening to just, you know, people on YouTube and, and thought leaders and somebody that I, I get so much content from and, and nuggets and, and support, like, you know, not support, but ideas from is uh, Marie Forleo. Um, she, she, she has a line that I just love and it's clarity comes from engagement, not thought. 
-hmm. And, you know, you can sit around thinking, 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 but until you take action and either win or learn instead of fail, I like to say win or learn, Mm -hmm. um, you won't know. So I, anyway, Marie Forleo Forleo is really uh, inspirational too. So she's got a book called Everything is Figure Outable, which I haven't read yet, but I, it'll probably be at the top of my list. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, Traction's great. EOS is is a lifesaver. Um, so next question is who is a franchise leader that you look up to? Yeah, that's uh, it's a good question. Um, the first person that popped into my head is actually my dad. Um, he's no longer in the world of franchising as of he sold the company to private equity a number of years ago, but what it's so interesting how often when I'm teaching and all that, and I reflect back, I mean, we we didn't get to 500 units by, by not by doing something wrong you know we obviously not everything was perfect and right but he really understood people and was a very natural leader and anybody that i run into to this day that remembers him in the franchise space is like you know you know there was something about him so he pops into my head one of my current mentors is dan monahan of clear summit group and he's fantastic and i also absolutely adore uh, Mary Kennedy Thompson, COO of Neighborly. And uh, she's a bit of a lifeline of mine when I, I reach out to her for, for things now and then. And so those are three, three people that have been really influential for me. Awesome. And Angela, last question, I promise, where can people find out more about you and your company? Awesome. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate this. Um, I'm really active on, well, most social media about this, especially LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm there at Angela Cote. Um, of course, just check me out on my website, angelacote.com. That's C O T E. Um, or, uh, email at Angela at angelacote.com. <laughs> All those things. <laughs> awesome. Well, Angela, again, thank you so much for jumping on the call. Uh, well podcast, you have provided like so much information that I know, uh, all of our listeners are going to find valuable. Awesome. Well, I have an outro that I say, I don't know if you've heard it, but it's go be awesome. I love it. I absolutely love it. All right. right. Thanks and take care. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Franchise Marketing Podcast. If you found this episode useful, share it with a friend and subscribe now so you don't miss out on any upcoming episodes. And until then, happy marketing.